Welcome to the Magical Melting Pot podcast series that celebrates America's diversity through food, where leading culinary experts share their stories, cultures, and career journeys. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to have Nino Asaro here today, who is a chef, a food aficionado, a food entrepreneur, farmer, and fifth generation olive oil producer from Sicily. So he's got a lot of wonderful things to share, and I'm, I'm so happy that he agreed to be with us today. So Nino, just to begin, you grew up in a family with a long tradition of food and agriculture in Sicily. Can you describe the importance that producing high quality olive oil and other Italian foods meant to you and your family and the influence that it's had on you to this day? Because I know it's something that you think about and you, you love very passionately. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Michelle, first of all, for having me on the show. And uh, I'll be happy to kind of introduce myself and, and tell you a little bit more about the food and agriculture in Sicily. Definitely producing a high quality product uh, makes you feel different, one, with the final consumer, with the people that you interact with. You're not only producing something for the uh, need of consuming a product of, of, of nutrition, nutrition yourself for just the mere act of eating, but rather for trying to uh, you know, share my passion and my history, what my family has been done uh, with others. Producing an high quality olive oil in my case has allowed me to open new doors and, and in a way uh, kind of know people within the food sector and people that might necessarily not have had such a passion in food and rather educate them uh, on, on quality. What quality brings is, uh, is openness. When you bring quality to the table, uh, people tend to be more open with yourself. Uh, they tend to show more of their emotion, uh, their way of thinking, their true selves, rather than just bringing a product. So definitely bringing a quality olive oil or a quality pasta, a quality olive uh, has allowed me and my family uh, to really start playing a different role in the food industry and being more of uh, educators within it other than uh, being farmers and producers. So are you educating people within, within Sicily, within Italy, the US, globally? Can you just talk a little bit about how you are educating people? Um, I'm not an expert on olive oil, but to me, there seem to be a lot of similarities to wine. There's so much that goes into it. The type of the olive, the when you pick it, the terroir, like all these different things. and you know, many people think of it as a commodity, but it's really not. Yes. So in terms of education, it spans uh, from uh, all parts of the globe. Primarily, we're focusing on the United States and, uh, and Italy. Uh, from an Italian perspective, you find a consumer that's a little bit more educated compared to the American one, but at the same time is way more stubborn than the American one. The American consumer tends to be much more open and straightforward, wants to learn more, uh, wants to embrace a uh, new culture and at the same time, see if uh, in within his or her train of thoughts, he or she has uh, some flaws or you know how can they improve that train of thoughts. Ideally, when we educate people, I wouldn't really say education because I think that the word itself implies this kind of superiority aspect from, from the teacher, but rather it should be a conjunction of, of both of us you know, you teach, I teach you about olive oil and you teach me the way you see olive oil. And that's the best way for me to eventually, you know, then put the oil out there and perhaps share it with a market uh, that I personally am, would be not familiar with or with someone that has a different point, point of view or someone that sees olive oil or olives or, or all this product, food in general, and in a different way, but still, you know, it, it's a viable way. It's a, it's a honest, it's an honorable way of seeing it. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. So in reading about you, you're, you have such a diverse interest related to food, uh, but you've been a chef at a top Italian restaurant in New York. You're writing a cookbook. You're overseeing the marketing website development and social media for your family's olive oil business in the U.S. Uh, and you're in a really interesting food program. I think that you're partly constructing yourself at NYU. So can you just talk a little bit about your food journey um, all the different paths that you've taken so far and kind of where you see yourself going in the future? Sure. Uh, to, to summarize it, it's uh, it, as stereotypical as it might sound, it did start in my grandma's kitchen. 
I was never really big into sports growing up or any other uh, extracurricular activity, quote unquote. So I would just hang out with my grandma most of the time since the age of five or six and start making fresh pasta, start making the ragu, anything is soups. And for some reason, all the feelings, uh, all the uh, five senses were really involved in the kitchen in a way that I'd not experienced anywhere else. Just the fact of coming in into my grandma's kitchen and smelling it, then touching things, then hearing sounds, sizzlings, uh, feeling even with my eyes, just the atmosphere of feeling warmer for some reason, even if the, the color might have not changed and then seeing the transformation within food. That really started my uh, kind of clicked in my head and said, okay, I need to focus more on food. And eventually, uh, when I moved to the United States at the age of 13, I decided that it was best for me instead of uh, continuing or pretending to do an extracurricular activity within the school system to go outside and, and seek uh, internships or seek stages, as they call in the restaurant industry. And I started working uh, up the ladder. I started as a dishwasher at Frankie's 570 in the West Village uh, of Manhattan. Uh, eventually, uh, I was going from dishwashing to prepping, and this was uh, every day after school. From prepping, then eventually they said, okay, you can come here uh, and be a line cook during the weekend. And for those of you uh, who don't know, essentially the prep cook is the one that preps all the ingredients, cuts it, uh, makes sure that it's ready for then the line cook is the cook that while you go at the restaurant, let's say from six to whenever they're open, is actually the one assembling the food, preparing it, cooking in a different way and making sure that your meal is served delicious, hot and, uh, and, and moist. Eventually, I moved out of Frankie Spuntino, uh, started working for uh, Frank Di Carlo, which was the uh, a, a kitchen called Peasant in, uh, in Elizabeth Street uh, between Spring and Prince. It was one of those quintessential New York City downtown restaurants that opened in 1999. And the energy that I felt there, I did not feel at any restaurant uh, that I ever been or worked in. It was a whole wood-fired kitchen. Uh, I was 16 when I first stepped in the kitchen and eventually left it at the age of 18. It was the real only kitchen where I felt almost I was in the farm of Sicily having a party with my, uh, with my classmates or something. And it felt just very natural to me of working with wood fire, working with cast iron, and just working out a very rustic and ancient way, almost a primordial way of cooking, but yet so true and, and so to the point. The food the peasant wasn't the crazy, wasn't the, the most interesting or sophisticated. Definitely, we did not care about molecular cuisine. We did not care about, uh, you know, perfect sauces in a, in, in a French way, but rather we wanted to highlight rustic and peasant Italian food. And I think that really shaped the way I used to think about food that I went from loving fine dining and everything about it, but then also realizing that fine dining, you know, is not really affordable for everyone. And you want to give food to the people, to as many as you can. And peasant food on the other end that, that's often looked down is the most delicious and is the most accessible to, to, more, to more people. Then with the same team of... Uh, of, uh, of peasant, uh, we opened a restaurant in uh, Greenport out of the North Fork of Long Island called uh, Barba Bianca, the white beer, which was essentially, uh, peasant was more focused on rustic Italian from the countryside. So mostly focusing on meat, uh, pigs, uh, dishes that you would find in inner Sicily, inner Sardinia, most of North of Italy. Barba Bianca was more of a coastal, still rustic Italian restaurant where we, uh, we served the sconch, uh, we call it in Italian scungili, uh, razor clams. We started experimenting with a lot of uh, algae and a lot of uh, ancient recipes that, that you would find in, in trattorias or osterias in Italy that were kind of unknown to the area. And that, and that was a really big success. Then eventually I moved on to, uh, to college, uh, kind of left the kitchen aside, uh, but then started operating a speakeasy restaurant out of my apartment, it was called Clandest Dine. And the idea was precisely to democratize in a way, fine dining and make it more accessible for college students and then you know anyone else that, that would join. The rules were really simple. Uh, you could only book one ticket, so you could not come with any friend. The point was especially to sit at a table with other seven people and meet them. 
Additionally, you could only tell me your food preferences and your food allergies, but you wouldn't know uh, what the menu itself was. And it was a fun way for me to, to start, again, young and fresh in New York, and at the same time, start meeting people from different backgrounds, started creating a community uh, that revolved around good food, you know, and, and it was accessible for everyone. And it was done on Monday nights precisely because I felt that Mondays could have been, you know, a cool day uh, to chat, uh, to kind of create the circles of, of communication, of philosophy, of, of fun. And, and it really became a, kind of a big hit. I did shut it off after about a year. I just started embracing other projects. I was uh, working a little bit consulting with some restaurants uh, in Italy and in the United States. I studied at Crasios in Naples for about three months over one summer, then came back and, uh, and started to focus myself more uh, within the family business. I've always been a part of it, but it was kind of a exterior from the business itself so i started embracing the, the role of marketing developer and uh, marketing uh, manager in a way started focusing more on the social media uh, web uh, influencing campaign etc and now I, I finally moved on in more of a business development uh, kind of new product uh, creation new product development new product launch uh, uh, new product implementation uh, widening the distribution and so on and so forth and definitely covid uh, since COVID is it, it has restricted me more towards this role uh, rather than uh, than more the, the creative one. As much as I would like to do it, uh, I, I'm preferring to stay more focused on the CPG side, uh, uh, direct to retail at the moment, with the intention of eventually going back more towards a marketing role, a communication role, uh, more of a storytelling role within the company. So are you looking to develop new products in the US primarily? And if so, are they entirely new products or is it more just introducing certain things that you think Americans um, don't know much about but would really enjoy? Because I find with all cuisines in, in America, uh, very often it's the stereotypical ones that come here first and little by little people get more sophisticated and they're more interested in regional cooking and things like that. Um, so I'm just curious, the, the focus of, of the, the new product area, I'm also related to that, interested in uh, what are some of the Sicilian foods? Well, first of all, what is Sicilian cooking like? How is it different from Italian? And is there a kind of a lack of understanding in the U.S. or familiarity that you think could be further developed? Sure. So just to talk about Sicilian food in general, I think it's completely different than the stereotypical uh, Italian-American food of just a red sauce, gravy, uh, meat, and pasta, uh, which tends to be a little bit more true for Neapolitan cuisine. Uh, Sicilian food tends to be, uh, first of all, you just have a conglomerate of so many different cultures. We have uh, Arabic influence, Greek influence, a little bit of or Norman influence, uh, the, the more so still a different kind of Arabic influence, but it, it tends to be much fresher uh, lighter. It's really, really bright in flavors, but uh, it's really to the point. We don't consume as much tomato sauce dishes as per se one would think, but rather we, we tend to gravitate more towards uh, fish. A lot of it has a lot of similarity with Middle Eastern food. Uh, we do tend to have sweeter tones even in our pasta. For example, the, the epitome of Sicilian cooking is pasta con le sarde or a pasta with sardines, which is usually made for uh, the Feast of St. Joseph on uh, March 19th. And it's this pasta that adopts uh, uh, raisins, uh, uh, sardines, then you put wild fennel, then you add uh, some saffron. You, some people even like to add a, a little touch of sugar and a little bit of manna, which is this uh, kind of uh, a natural sugar that falls from a tree and kind of shows how, you know, in Italian cooking, you hardly find raisins, but it's they were brought in by the Moors. Similar with the saffron, it was kind of a more of Eastern uh, <clears throat> product coming in into Sicily as well. Then you have the all the sardines, so a really big focus on the Mediterranean. They could also uh, come from the Greek culture. You know, if you go in Milan, you hardly gonna eat. Uh, you know, the the typical Milanese cuisine doesn't have any fish involved other than a fish that would be stored per se, where in Sicilian cooking, everything is just like fresh. 50 to 60% of the diet is only on fish and vegetable. And when it comes to meat, it's mostly games or uh, rabbit, pigeons, uh, 
and then any offal, uh, any other part of the animal that uh, was kind of left over just because of its poor history. While it has a rich culture, Sicily has also gone through a lot of uh, major crises and has tended to be a much more poor region compared to the other ones. So we always embrace kind of the, the peasant cooking, what we call the, the quinto quarto, which is like the fifth fourth. So uh, not everything that remains, but rather like the what everyone doesn't want to eat, uh, we take in, we embrace it, and we make something special out of it. Wow, so great. then mm -hmm. to, to answer your question about new product development, definitely new products. Uh, we want to focus mostly in the United States. We do have some plans for uh, the Italian market, uh, but it tends to be way tougher and uh, at the same time way more saturated. Uh, when it comes to the United States, you want to be careful introducing something that's way too unique even though uh, it might be a really, really good product, it's often hard to communicate and pass through the clutter. So th the best strategy that, that, that we always approach is to kind of have a product that is truly Italian, but at the same time, it's simple enough that it could fit in an Italian-American or a, you know, a national cuisine. So it, it has an Italian undertone, but could be used by, by many people. An example would be a, just a classic uh, arrabbiata sauce Perhaps in, a, in an American scenario, in an Italian-American scenario, they would add a marinara sauce with something spicy in Sicily or in Campania or in, in the Lazio region. The arrabbiata sauce precisely does not call for, uh, for any oregano or any of the spices, but rather just uh, aglione, which is a big aglio, uh, big garlic that tends to be way, way sweeter than the classic garlic that we get here in the United States. And then just uh, Calabrian chilies and, and tomato sauce cooked with olive oil for about three, four hours. So it's this really intense, uh, almost sweet, spicy uh, tomato sauce that, that is quite distinct in its kind. And, you know, it, it differs slightly from the Italian-American version, but yet the, the slight difference makes it Italian or American. Similarly, I, I think you cannot, uh, you know, debunk Italian-American cuisine or in the American, Italian-American culture precisely because there's a lot of uh, good things coming out of it. And in some extent, it also helped pave the way for what is, you know, considered now true Italian food to make it to the United States. Italian-Americans definitely, you know, didn't per se have the best education or best, uh, you know, teaching skills. But they did, you know, introduce this idea of Italian food to the United States uh, back when, you know, the United States was mostly eating an Anglo-Saxon based meal or, uh, you know, mostly focusing on root vegetables, uh, some games and, uh, and mostly, you know, a Northern European uh, cuisine. So uh, I, I think even in new products development, we're making a new products. It's okay to make uh, an Italian-American product but with higher ingredients. What often lacks in Italian-American food is the quality of the ingredients rather than the recipe or the thought behind the recipe itself or the technique, which in most cases tends to be perfect or even better than you know, an Italian technique that we would have not thought about. Awesome. It's making me want to go to Sicily. My last question, but I'll get to it in a few more questions is um, I, I totally just listening to you makes me want to go to Sicily so much. I'm going to ask you later about highlights of what things that you shouldn't miss. But just before we get there, can you share? Um, I, lo I love the story of you know, your grandmother's influence on you. I think it's with just just wonderful. I think a lot of people can relate to that. What were some of your favorite foods growing up? Um, and who made them? Was it your grandmother? Was it your mom, your dad? Were they for holidays or special days of the week? I think the recipe that you shared with us was a pasta that you liked Wednesday nights and it was sort of traditional. Um, but if you could just talk a little bit about that, um, you know, anything just more about your, your grandmother, was she the one who mainly cooked for your family? And I, it seems like she was a very big influence on you. She seemed very special. Sure. Uh... And that's a really interesting question because uh, in Sicily, you tend to have a very matriarchal society within the household. So the grandmas, either from the dad side or the mom side, tend to cook for the entire family. And then usually the parents, uh, my mom, tended to cooking more at night. So during the lunchtime, 
the grandmas, either one or, would take care of the, the meal for the old family. So any kids, you know, you would have these huge tables every day, almost if it was a feast. And then at night, each one of us would respectively be in their own home and the mothers uh, would cook the meals. What was special, something that, that really reminded me of Sicily was this pasta con broccolo arriminato, which is a pasta with uh, essentially twisted broccoli, but it's twisted cauliflower. It was this uh, also really Arabic influenced pasta that was started to be cooked in Palermo around the, the 1800s, but uh, kind of the, the new variation, that's where it comes from. And it includes uh, pine nuts, uh, some uh, raisins, and it's this really humble peasant dish where you take this cauliflower, you boil it, then you just make a puree out of it. You eventually stir it with the pasta and you let the pasta cook within this broccolo water, this, this cauliflower water. And essentially the pasta itself absorbs all this flavor with a little bit of raisin, a little bit of pine nuts. Then some people even like to toast some almonds. It becomes this dish that's really, really tasty and really affordable. And, you know, it's great for everyday cooking. What makes it special uh, about Wednesday night wasn't necessarily, I think, because my mom decided that Wednesday was the night for this pasta, but rather Wednesday we had the, 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 the market, the town's market, in, in Mercado del Mercoledì. So where my great-grandma would go to the market, uh, pick whatever vegetable was in season. And I, I love spring. I, I think it's my favorite season within the produce section. And she would always bring every Wednesday this cauliflower. Uh, my grandma for lunch, uh, she would make it fried with a pastella, uh, almost a Sicilian tempura, but uh, tended to be a little bit heavier and a little bit uh, more pastosa, so the, more doughy. And then my mom at night would still use the other half of the cauliflower to make uh, this pasta con broccolo adiminato. Additionally, then my grandma from my father's side made this dish that was called a Merluzzo in umido, and it, it's just extremely simple in concept and in thought, but I, I never had a merluzzo as good as her. And what is merluzzo? Merluzzo is a baby Mediterranean cod. Uh, I, I have not been able to find it in the United States. I'm pretty sure you can find it, but uh, it's probably frozen. It's and, and really hard to, uh, to scout. I haven't been able to do so so far. However, it was this, this baby uh, cod that you just boil in a little water, like a parsley water with a little white wine. You put everything cold in the pan, garlic, olive oil, parsley, the baby cod, a little salt, a little pepper. You turn the heat on and within 15 minutes, this dish was done. You know, it required no prep, no extra work. But when you add this fish, the, the, there was something about it, right? whether it was the, the, the saltiness perhaps coming from the quality here, the high quality of the fish, and at the same time, the Mediterranean salinity, which actually a lot of fish in Sicily, as a side note, doesn't really need salt because it's already much more saltier and tastier. But at the same time, the, there was this, this ritual of my grandma making this simple dish, putting it on the table, finishing the entire uh, cod, and the best part was yet to come, was all the sauce that was kind of left uh, on the pot. And, you know, all the, the niece, nephews, anyone that was there would just do a scarpetta. So take a piece of bread, dip it in the sauce. And there was something so magical and, and just so satisfactory about that moment that until this day, uh, every time I go back home, I always ask my mom for the pasta con broccolo arriminato and my grandma for the merluzzo in umido. That's fabulous. I love it. You, you're so articulate and you're such an amazing storyteller. Um, I could listen to you forever. So I know you're working on a cookbook with your grandmother. And I think that's just, just the, that idea in itself is fabulous. But what is the perspective that you're going to bring? Um, and when, when can people be look, start looking for it? Sure. So uh, for the past uh, seven, eight years that I've been in the United States, my, my grandma played a crucial role in terms of uh, keeping the connection with Italy uh, to the point that I, up to this day, I still FaceTime her at least once a day. And the first question that I would ever ask her was uh, not, how are you? Neither I was a grandpa or what's going on in Partana, my small town, but rather, what did you eat? I was so curious 
perhaps because we were already linked by this cooking connection when I grew up in Sicily. But rather, I, I just felt a lot of energy coming out of her. And at the same time, a different emotion every time she would tell me, oh, I had uh, pasta con l'olio, or I had a carbonara, or I had some uh, swordfish. But every time, somehow, a truer emotion and a visual, just seeing her on FaceTime, I, I would just be fascinated by the, her emotion with the dish that they actually hate. And then I would just follow up with some other question, you know, how's the day, uh, you know, how's everything going? Are you stressed? Are you happy? What's going on? And then interestingly, there were a lot of connection that she ate a lot of clean, very bright food when she was in a really good mood, uh, when she was stressed or something was going on, whether in Italy, in the family, just in, in general, she would eat more of like soups, more hearty stuff, something to really fill her up and almost uh, make her forget about it. And, and then she would eat very spicy food when she was extremely happy. Uh, she wanted to always do something more festive or something a little bit uh, uh, spicy, tingly, uh, whether it was an arrabbiata or, or something just uh, for the old table. So more of a family meal style. Uh, little did I know that uh, after about seven years of talking to her, so about uh, almost nine months ago, I, I said I have a beautiful amount of data that has always been passed down through oral tradition that I need to start recording. So I started recording it and essentially recording her diet, recording her repeating this diet, recording the emotional aspect within the diet, recording her train of thought, what was going on within the family, outside of the family. And so collecting a, a diet that is not only made of food, but is made of emotion, of ideas, of, of way of feeling. Eventually, I started then collecting all this data, analyzing it, and seeing, you know, the the analysis that, that I brought in a couple of sentences ago. So now I'm writing this cookbook that includes both the recipes that she ate, as well as the more of a psychological, uh, you know, the, the psychoanalysis between food, the emotional aspect between food, and, you know, and why precisely this Mediterranean diet works. So many books, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of books within the Mediterranean diet section, you know, why you should embrace Mediterranean diet, but most of them are focused on the scientific part, on the nutritional aspect, on the uh, culinary aspect, but no one really focuses on the emotional side. A lot of people, you know, in Italy, you know, why do we have a lot of longevity? I think it's the country with the highest longevity. It, it's always competing against Japan, but precisely because people tend to have a happy life they live healthy, they eat healthy, but at the same time, they, they embrace seasonality. And within the seasonality, within just change of times and change of scenery and change of emotion, they adapt their food to it. And if you really think about it, it's a really primordial instinct. Any animal, uh, you know, I'm going to take the example of a dog. Uh, if you've ever been in a wild place or uh, where you find stray dogs or strain animals, when dogs have uh, stomach problems, they start eating a lot of grass. They, they start eating a lot of, uh, you know, greens precisely to clean their stomach. Hmm. Similarly, with uh, it happens with horses, but, uh, or, or with cows, you know, when they, they have some problems going on, they tend to go eat the grass. When they're really healthy, they eat their, their hay or, uh, you know, nuts, whatever else they're, they're being fed. So I felt that there was a lot of resemblance. And now what I'm doing is writing this book with my grandma. Uh, my grandma more talking about the, the gastronomical side and the experience itself as the, the protagonist and me uh, delving a little bit. Thanks also to the help of NYU and the more of the psychological uh, aspect and, you know, and everything else that has to do with the sentimental, emotional uh, linkage to the Mediterranean diet. Uh, hopefully, uh, I was hoping to launch it by August 2021. Uh, I'm kind of in a limbo. And so I would say you, you can probably uh, start looking for it about January 2022. But it's, uh, I'm writing it. Uh, it's on its way, but uh, taking a little bit longer, uh, precisely because I want to make sure that, it, that it's true to, to my core and true to my grandma and, and a great book.
Oh, it sounds wonderful. Really. And just, I love hearing about it. It's so emotional. And I think so many people will be able to relate to it on a certain level, but also learn from it. So um, can you just share with our listeners a little bit about the products your family business sells in the U.S., um, where they might find the products? And I think you have a website, so you have some e-commerce. I know I tried your, um, your, all, your artichoke hearts that were the best I've ever had. It was in a jar, but they were unbelievable. And um, maybe Thank you could you. share a little bit about the products and where people can find them. Sure. So uh, my family have been family of farmers uh, for more than three centuries, uh, but started the, the company itself, Olefici Asar, in 1916, producing olive oil for two reasons. We used to produce olive oil for, uh, you know, as edible foods, but also we produce olive oil to then make soap out of it, and we used to sell it within the town. So my great-great-grandfather was known as the kind of the, the clean guy in the town for supplying soap made with olive oil uh, instead of animal fats. Eventually, then San Tommaso migrated to the United States in 1923 and started focusing only on the edible side of olive oil and bringing one of the first branded extra virgin olive oil, uh, Sicilian olive oil in the United States. And the brand is called Partanna, P-A-R-T-A-N-N-A. And up to this day, uh, we still have the same design that my great grandpa designed with the same quality olive oil, uh, pressed in a more technologically advanced way. So it does preserve a better flavor. You know, we, we now press it way colder than they used to press uh, back in the days. We are able to, uh, to store it in, you know, stainless steel containers in a way that doesn't oxidize. We're able to uh, to preserve the product better. And eventually, you know, I think with technology, you just tend to improve a product, but we stay true to the, that tradition. Then eventually in 1972, my grandpa took over the, the company in Sicily, expanded the manufacturing capabilities, and then started seeing a niche within the olive sector. A lot of olives were eaten in, in Sicily, um, never really made it to the export in the United States. Uh, but we decided to start pickling the olives a little bit earlier than, than most uh, would do. And kind of, we were one of the first uh, pioneers within the Castelvetrano variety, which is this bright uh, green olives that's not as salty as the other olives, uh, is really buttery, uh, sweet. And it's kind of known as the popcorn of olive or the olive for those that don't like olives. And we started importing also to the United States uh, in 19, 1973 uh, through our importing company that was uh, called the Acero Brothers Company. And we also did have a store in Bushwick uh, that it closed down in 2006 and hopefully will be back up uh, at some point in the next uh, four or five years. And it was on uh, Arving Avenue and uh, Arving Avenue and Knickerbogger. That's where my great grandpa uh, uh, kind of settled, created this company. And it was a little shop that used to sell olive oil, olives, cheeses uh, to the Italian American community, precisely within the tri-state area. Then my father came on, uh, on board in 1990. Uh, he was almost 18 years old, uh, didn't finish high school precisely because he was just too in love with the farming practices, too in love with with the sector itself so found out that the school wasn't for him decided to jump on the wagon and and started kind of modifying our farming practices he just was a really uh far-sighted uh human being he is a really far-sighted human being still alive thankfully and uh and so the the fact that we needed to become more sustainable, we needed to implement uh, multi-crafting so we needed to start planting other trees other vegetable within our olive fields. We want to do the same also for all the consortium. So we started working as a consortium of farmers of the Valle del Belige. Uh, at the moment, around 600 families revolved around our business. So they pick their olives, they come to us in October, they sell us their olive. But at the same time, we do uh, kind of, we teach them on the background, we give them uh, some ideas, we, we give them support and you know, how you want to prune the tree this year, seeing, you know, the weather, when do you want to start picking it, what size are, are we looking for and so forth. So we start implementing this multi-crafting variation and then asked as many of the farmers uh, to 
to convert their farmings in organic. Uh, we did convert our own farm, uh, all of them in uh, USDA organic, European approved organic. But uh, at the same time, we found out that a lot of those farmers, unfortunately, didn't even have the money to afford the organic certificate. So you find an olive oil that is not certified organic, but in and, it, on, in and of its nature is kind of an organic, you know, it, one, because Europe doesn't allow as many pesticides, as many, uh, you know, all the chemicals that are allowed in, in American agriculture. And two, uh, because it's, it's really an ancient way that was passed down to generation, from generation to generation. So all the farmers that you saw in Sicily, they never really had uh, a farming school per se, but rather they, they started being on the tractor when they were five years old with their parents and grandparents, and, and the story goes on. Then in, uh, in 2005, uh, we, we saw kind of all those plants and the citrus tree, the, the, uh, the artichoke, the eggplants uh, kind of blossoming. And at the same time, being way more in production that, that we could have ever imagined. Uh, and then we started creating a more niche line that's called Asa Organic Farm. And it's currently sold uh, on bestsicily.com. And it was a niche of all those products that we had within the farm, within the olive orchards, that we started, uh, I wouldn't say processing, but rather packing it and, and making it, uh, uh, cooking it. I, I don't like the word processing it because I feel like it implies uh, uh, there's uh, some manipulation happening to the product, but we, we tried to be as true and as uh, natural to the product itself. So we started roasting the artichoke cart uh, over wood fire and then packing in it with some olive oil a little bit of mint, a little bit of white wine vinegar. Uh, we made a pate out of it. We started making eggplant caponata. Now we're making uh, some tomato sauce. Uh, we, we have now uh, finally a lot of almond trees, so we're starting to import almonds. Uh, I mean, again, a small production within the, uh, the vegetable and produce section. We mostly specialize on olive oil, but those are really niche, niche product that uh, it's quite unbelievable. One of the traceability behind it that, Every lot, I can tell you uh, where, which tree uh, it came from, as well as when it was picked and what other plants were surrounding it, which at times really does make a difference. For example, this year we had uh, an extra virgin olive oil that tasted a little bit more like uh, green tomatoes. Uh, last year it was a little bit more spicy. You had notes of bitter almond and artichoke. This year was more of, of green tomato. We found out that uh, actually the green tomatoes, the tomatoes that were growing within the orchard uh, had developed better for some reason, uh, had already grown a little bit premature. So they had some extra nutrients to, to give away to the trees and started you know, doing this mineral exchange with the olive trees that then proved to be uh, that we had an olive oil with an aftertaste of of green tomato that was really, really pleasant, uh, not as bitter or as pizzicante as last year, but really, really unique uh, in its variety. Then in terms of other positioning uh, within the United States, in 2010, in 2006, we uh, reshifted uh, our import company from Master Brothers Company to a United Olive Oil Import Corp. And we started paving the way uh, for U.S. consumer to major retailers. We were the, the first to uh, sell unfiltered uh, olive oil. So it was essentially the juice of the olive uh, exactly from the press directly into the bottle. A lot of uh, the olive oil that you see, you know, conventional supermarkets or before that was filtered. A lot of people looked for the consistency in, uh, in color, in uh, in in flavor, in texture, but those were chemically manipulated oil that really didn't translate or didn't uh, quite praise what a natural product olive oil is. At the end of the day, just like orange juice, every orange is going to be slightly different. Every year you're going to produce a different fruit, a different, you know, they're going to have different amount of pulp, different amount of, uh, of water content. And, and so is olive oil. So we said, okay, and while it's different, at the beginning, people were, were saying, why is your oil so green? Why is your oil uh, so cloudy? Why is your oil, uh, you know, uh, a little bit murky or, or, or dirty in a way? What does it leave sediment? And we started then teaching everyone about, okay, this is why unfiltered oil is better for you. It's less manipulated. It's not filtered. It's 
everything that comes from the olive juice freshly pressed in the olive oil. At the same time, then you know, we were fortunate to go in a wave of where a lot of university, University of Palermo, then Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, were conducting studies on Mediterranean diet benefit and precisely uh, olive oils and found out that in unfiltered olive oils, there was a way higher polyphenol content, uh, which helped prevent cardiovascular diseases, was great for a pregnant woman uh, to, to carry on. It was great for building the placenta, as I was suggested, you know, to have a, a teaspoon every morning. Uh, there were other studies that, that, that prevented kind of uh, uh, any brain uh, diseases, just pr protected membranes and, and so on and so forth. We kind of embraced, uh, we were one of the first to embrace this wave of unfiltered uh, olive oils. And, and the pioneer within that section were two supermarkets that uh, saw the vision with us, one being Whole Foods and the second one being HEB in Texas and started uh, thankfully, uh, you know, educating their customers with our help. And, you know, also with their help, we were able to educate a wider audience. So it was a win-win relationship for both where uh, we we gave on a market a product that was way healthier that was just really undiscovered at the beginning. But now, when you go in any supermarket, you will find an unfiltered olive oil that's either coming from my family or or some somebody else or some other competitor. Additionally, we in 2017, kind of our last uh, frontier was uh, okay. We have all those beautiful produce. We have uh, we have the olives. We have the olive oil. We have all the vegetables, all the anything that you could possibly make a condiment with, but we're lacking the the main vehicle. We're lacking what Italians love the most, which is pasta. So we became partner with a small pastificio uh, in uh, in Petrosino uh, in in Trapani, so right up on the hill where Edice is, and tried to focus only on traditional Sicilian cuts. And the one that we decided to focus was the busiata which is that this traditional Sicilian shape made with a sphere. So it's a linguina that's eventually a thick linguina, eventually rolled with a sphere. And you have a fusillo looking shape of pasta that uh, engineeringly uh, it attracts, uh, it, it contains 75% more sauce than uh, your, average, uh, your average cut. It contains 82% more sauce than a spaghetto. So if you were to eat spaghetti, you would need 82% more pasta to uh, attract, attract that much sauce. And this pasta per se uh, really was true to our nature because as Sicilians, as Trapanesi from Partana was a, a dish, was a, was a shape that was highly heated, but at the same time was a niche in the United States that uh, was almost impossible to find. So we decided to, uh, to focus on the pastificio with the Partana brand and start bringing Busiata Trapanesi. We're now working on a couple of different shape. We recently launched the Linguina Rustica. It's a rustic linguina that's a little bit round shaped, uh, a little bit uh, addentata, like uh, with the little teeth. So it has a little a zigzag uh, on the edges. And those are uh, pastas that used to be eaten with soups or minestre with, uh, with beans. So we're trying to re-educate or re-bring back, revalorize uh, uh, ancient cuts in, with ancient grains uh, that, that were gone missing. Essentially, you know, the market we saw that was impossible to compete against the big producer of, uh, of spaghetti, linguine, just because of, you know, their current status, their stability and, and their factory capacity. But there was a big niche of all these uh, ancient cuts that, that were kind of undiscovered within the market and highly appreciated by chefs and, and restaurateurs. So that was kind of a, the last mile of it. And at the moment, we're working on starting to import wines. Uh, the, the second largest uh, crop in Sicily, other than olive, is wine. So we are working on a line of wines that hopefully will launch in, in 2022. We're in the process of setting up the... Uh, the yeah. liquor uh, imports, et cetera, but uh, we're looking forward to that. And then in terms of the product, you can, uh, you can find it a bit all over within the New York City uh, area and a lot of independent stores. You can also find it uh, if you're in the Midwest, the Mayor, Giant Eagle, uh, you can find that at Shaw's, you can find that uh, Albertson uh, in 
in California, uh, we do have buy right, uh, kind of many, many more. And uh, if you want to know more, uh, please, you know, uh, you can look it up at unitedoliveoil.com. Uh, write that as an email, tell us where you are, and we'll direct you uh, to the best shop uh, closest Fabulous. to you. Fabulous. So I just have one more question. Um, again, now that people can't travel because of COVID, we're dreaming of our next trip when we are able to travel. And Sicily is my, for sure, hundred percent, my next trip. What are the things that for just, you know, in a few minutes, if you could just share highlights, someone interested in food and really knowing Sicily, let's say they, they have a week in Sicily. What are some of the highlights that you would recommend? Okay. So quick highlights that I would recommend is definitely fly to Palermo, uh, stay in Palermo for at least three days and see three different phases of Palermo, the street food side. So the three market, Ballarò, Vucciuria, and Capo. Eat like Palermitano, so all the street food, all the offos, all the, the panelle, the fried vegetables. Then uh, do the, uh, what we call the, the Palermo Bene, the, the, the good Palermo, the wealthy Palermo, which doesn't have to be expensive, but rather you start eating a little bit more of the refined, the, the new way of, of concepting Sicilian cooking. Uh, which tends to be lighter and you will find, you know, uh, much more fish based dishes or recreation of, of traditional cuisines, something that you would find in the market in a more modern uh, and sophisticated setting. And then third, I would say, go a little bit outside of Palermo, go in, uh, come down where I am in, in Selinunte, uh, which actually owes the largest Greek archaeological park uh, in the world uh, by actual, uh, size uh, interestingly bigger than Greece and we, to, we do have uh, two uh, standing temples uh, at the moment and actually an NYU uh, research team is excavating uh, at the moment trying to find that there should be a town that back in the days uh, I think had a population around uh, 100,000 but definitely uh, archaeology uh, fanatics out there please correct me if I'm wrong I would be happy uh, to even know more and then once you go to Salinunte, in our area, Salinunte, Shaka, you will experience a lot of amazing fish. So really focus on eating like sardines. Honestly, just the, the fish from the market grilled with a little olive oil and lemon. I, I wouldn't really uh, think of anything else. Maybe a spaghetto with vongole, maybe a uh, spaghetto with neonata, bottarga, but really keep it simple and true to its core. And then... Once you've made your three days on the west side of Sicily, uh, try to, uh, to go to Catania. I mean, ideally, you would want to stay in Sicily for at least a month just because there's so much to see. But if you have only one week, do three days on the west side and then another three, four days on the east and go visit Catania. Go visit all the little towns uh, within uh, Mount Etna at the bottom of Mount Etna. You should definitely have uh, a lot of pistachios from Bronte. Uh, if you're adventurous in Catania, people love horse meat. So uh, horse meat is kind of the, the street food in Catania. It's highly delicious. Go visit the Apescheria market in Catania. It's one of the best fish market that I've ever been to. And it's quite unique, quite unique in its kind. Eat a lot of crudos, eat around with the locals. If you go in the spring, eat a lot of the carcoccio attuppato, which is like the stuffed artichoke with a little breadcrumb, uh, some pecorino, Siciliano and, and garlic that you just eat on the street. You kind of peel it away. Make sure you have some granita. Uh, make sure you have some cannolo, cassatelle, some cassata. And, and really have fun. I think there, there's no real way of going wrong in Sicily. Uh, one, because uh, we're not as, as tourist driven as Rome per se. So there, there's no tourist trap, quote unquote. So everywhere you will go, you'll probably have a better time and, and you will not be uh, in, in trapped by, by any tourist trap or, or anything of that sort. And then again, you know, if, if you need any suggestion, feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll give you my contact at the end of the podcast. So, uh, you know, I want to make sure that, that you're having a great experience in Sicily. No, th this has been amazing. And um, I think I think we're out of time. So if you want to give your contact information now um, and, you know, people will get in touch with you, they'll look for your products, they'll look for your book when it comes out. And uh, yeah, I, I think you've made many of us really want to go to Sicily. 
uh, and look forward to seeing your wine and the new things that you'll be coming up with um, introducing going forward. So thank you, thank you so much for your time. So just if you want to repeat again, uh, we can also put it on, um, you know, the podcast will be listed on YouTube um, the, and uh, on our website. And so we can also put the contact information there. But if you want just one more time, if you don't mind sharing how they can get in touch. Sure. If you want to get in touch, the best way would be uh, through social media. You can find me on Facebook at uh, Nino Asaro, N-I-N-O dash A-S-A-R-O. Or similarly on Instagram at uh, Nino Asaro Oil. So N-I-N-O-A-S-A-R-O-I-L. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions. And then I will either be in Sicily or in New York. But uh, always available and making sure that uh, to further teach and, and, and hopefully uh, bring more passion within the food uh, industry. Thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.